Go into your room. That's right. Sit on that fat of yours and do nothing but listen to records. I don't know where your stereo starts, but mine starts across the street at a transformer supplied by Rockland Electric. And then it comes across the street and goes to my roof. And then it switches over to new copper wire from the old aluminum wire. And if you live in a home and you haven't replaced your wire from the roof, if you have an older home with aluminum wire, you really should do that because you can put a power conditioner on your system in your room, but there's no point in doing that until you get the electricity good outside. Then it comes down this pipe, copper wire, goes into a brand new smart meter, and the old meter was a dumb meter and it was really corroded, so the difference that made was pretty impressive. Then it goes into an outside main box. The main box used to be inside, now it's outside because I split it off here and one side of this goes into my home and powers all the dirty stuff and one side goes around the side of the house into a sub box outside my listening room that powers my audio system. And then the entire ground system was reconfigured that was creating all kinds of hum issues for 20 years. I should have done this a long time ago. So if you live in a home, you really ought to think about doing this. And now the ground is all connected together down here, all the different grounds goes into a cold water pipe on the other side of the house, comes out here, and then there are two 10-foot rods that were put in here to give a really good ground. And there's also a surge protector in here to protect the whole house because that's necessary. So that's the beginning of my audio system. Welcome to my room. Before I show you all my audio gear and my records, let's talk about the room, because the room is critical to the entire process. So I moved into this house 22 years ago. It's, uh, it's a bi-level house, so it's got a concrete floor, which is always a good thing for an audio system. It has three feet of cinder block coming up from the floor all around. And then above that is wallboard, the normal housing framing and, and wallboard. So you have hard surfaces and soft surfaces and that works really well acoustically. Also, I have this corridor that I just walked down, which almost acts like a port, and it has certain magical effects on the sound in the room. Even though the room is not that big, it's not that small either, it's 15 by about 22, if you count where the port is, and uh, it can have a lot of big speakers in here and do really, really well, as, as you'll see. So now let's talk about music, and let's talk about hi-fi, and let's talk about what a crazy space I have here, okay? They say there's nothing new under the sun. This grandioso T1 esoteric turntable is something new under the sun. It doesn't have a direct drive motor. It doesn't have a belt drive motor. It doesn't have an idler wheel drive motor. It has an induction based spinning system. So that means you've got a motor controller unit right here with a motor in it, totally isolated from the chassis and totally isolated from the platter. And on top of the motor is a cylinder with north-south poles on it. When this motor starts to spin, it affects a magnetic strip at the base of this 42 pound aluminum alloy platter and that causes the rotation of the platter. So there's no physical contact of the motor. And you can actually adjust the sound of this, not the speed, but the sound, by changing uh, the distance between the motor and the platter. And so they give you a micrometer adjustment here and you can change it. So the sound of this turntable is more uh, like a idler wheel drive, it's got that, that kind of punch, uh, but there's no noise, which is what idler wheel drives have, noise and rumble. There's no noise and rumble out of this, but you can change it from sounding more like a belt drive, if that's what you like, or sounding more like an idler wheel or direct drive turntable, if that's what you like. So this is totally unique. The 42 pound platter sits on a beautifully machined uh, bearing that is magnetically partially levitated so the thrust pad doesn't see 42 pounds it sees a much lighter weight and that's been done before but they did it here and that was a smart thing to do this table can take three arms it's got one arm on here now which is the uh, kuzma sapphire nine inch arm that uh, is under review right now as well and that arm is 
is a four point arm from Frank Kuzma, but it's got the sapphire uh, tube that makes it extremely rigid and it's extremely heavy. But uh, that review will be published in the Absolute Sound very shortly. And I reviewed it using the uh, Audio Technica uh, ATMC 2022 cartridge, which has a one piece um, diamond cantilever stylus assembly. So it's all made out of one piece, uh, la laboratory grade uh, grown diamond produced amazing sound that I'm not going to go into any more detail about because um, that'll be in the review. Uh, this turntable sells for around $70,000, which, yes, that's a lot of money, but in today's world of very expensive turntables, it's not there at the top. It's not for everybody, obviously, but for the person who can afford that kind of money, it's, uh, it's a compact solution. It can take three arms, and uh, so far, I'm very, very impressed with this turntable. This is my reference turntable. It's a prototype of the OMA K3 that I reviewed a couple of years ago. And that turntable costs $360,000 with the arm. And even at an accommodation price, I cannot afford that. But the prototype, which sounds identical to the finished product, I was able to uh, purchase at the cost of a nice car. <laughs> but you know what, it's my job. And, uh, and I love the sound of this turntable. And let me tell you something about it. It would take, an hour probably to go through everything that's in here. But let's start with the chassis. This is a cast iron chassis that weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. It took a couple of big beefy guys to hoist it atop my HRS rack here, which obviously they succeeded in doing. Fortunately, it didn't fall down. The design of this chassis was done in conjunction with Bucknell University using FEA analysis to make sure that this chassis is critically damped and not over damped or under damped and it is critically damped the key to this chassis is both the shape of it and the inclusion of chambers in the casting that are filled with a particulate matter uh, which is a liquid with some sort of particle in it and it's sealed inside of these brass plugs this is not for uh, aesthetics this is for keeping the liquid inside and never coming out. And the same is true here. These chambers are in this platter and the chambers are in this arm board. And so any energy that does manage to get into this heavy chassis gets turned into heat and dissipated. Very sophisticated. And it won an award from Bucknell University. They, they do consulting and work for uh, the physics and the departments that are involved in the science at Bucknell do a lot of projects for, for companies, and this product won a Product of the Year award a couple of years ago. And the casting itself is a sand ca a 3D sand casting that couldn't have been done a few years ago. So everything about this turntable, we're talking about analog, you know, 100-year-old uh, technology, but taken to the 21st century using modern um, technological things that couldn't have been done years ago. So that's this. The motor in here is also, it's a bespoke motor. It's something that was designed by the people who did this turntable. Uh, and the people who did this turntable are Jonathan Weiss at OMA, consulting with Richard Krebs, who is a hydraulics, industrial hydraulics engineer in New Zealand, who spent the last 40 years playing around with direct drive turntables. I mean, his real job is hydraulics. His fun job is mod modifying turntables. And he has a reputation around the world for modifying uh, Technics SP10 turntables to improve the sound quality. But in this turntable, they decided to start from the ground up and develop one from scratch. I hate to use the word scratch involved in turntables, but I'm using it. So they looked around the world and found the best possible stator that they could use, which is the, the part that has, uh, that's remains stable and never doesn't move and the rotor and the rotor and the stator are enclosed in here. And you'll see that the height of this turntable is not for aesthetics, it's to make sure that no part of the magnetic structure, which is the uh, rotor, is close enough to the platter surface for any magnetics to get into the cartridge. This cartridge happens to be an optical cartridge, but which is not involved with magnetics, but that's a whole nother story. Most people will be using this turntable with a magnetic cartridge. So the stator is is locked onto the bottom of this chassis. There's a, there's a, um, a shaft at the top of which has the rotor that spins. And all of this is controlled by a motor control system that they programmed 
over time, over thousands and thousands of listening hours and measuring hours uh, to get it to be not just rotate at the correct speed, but to rotate at the correct speed in tiny increments of time. And they found that by changing tiny increments of time, they could hear the difference in the sound. And they spent all of this time and locked it in where they think it sounds best. And because it can go on the internet, because it does have a, a USB port, they can say, oh, we've made a change. We've, we've discovered a, an even better programming. They can go from, from New Zealand and reprogram this turntable, which they haven't done yet. So that is the chassis. And oh, the, the finished version, which you, you've seen in a picture, I'm sure. To do that requires a five position CNC machine that is, wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. That's possible now. And if you know anything about CNC machining, it's got to be locked into uh, a device that holds it in place so it can be moved to the different aspects that the machining can be done. There are no places here to do it. I don't even know how they did that, but they managed to do it. So uh, everything about this turntable is the highest tech possible. Uh, this version, I like the way it looks. It's very simple looking. Let's talk about the platter for a second. So the platter is an oversized 24-pound uh, platter that's ceramic coated. It's got a brass insert in here. It's got some sort of felt damping. There are five or seven different elements that make this platter what it is. The bearing itself is a special bearing with a Teflon a sleeve, a special Teflon sleeve that never needs uh, lubrication, that breaks in over time. And when it's finally broken in, it has a certain amount of, of friction so that the motor control can never overdo what it's supposed to be doing, the minor little changes that it makes, a minor amount of friction. They thought this thing through from top to bottom, every aspect. It went through multiple, there was a K1, there was a K2 before the K3. And I saw and heard both of those actually. And uh, there's also a K5 coming out, which is a lower cost turntable. This is, this is their best turntable, the K3. The arm is a Frank Schroeder design. Many of you know Frank Schroeder. He's a preeminent a tone arm designer in Berlin. This is a uh, 3D printed select selective laser melt aluminum arm. And obviously it's open and the open structure is so that any, any vibrations that are coming in the air from the speaker don't get hung up on this arm. They just sort of pass through it. So that's one aspect of it. And it's extremely rigid and lightweight. Just It's the right weight, actually, because I've had multiple cartridges in here, and they all set up and work fine. The arm offers every setup function that you would ever want. Azimuth, stylus rake angle, um, obviously overhang, uh, everything. The counterweight, as you can see, is articulated. You can see here. So when the arm goes up, the counterweight goes down. And that maintains the consistency of both the tracking force weight and the way the arm behaves on a warp. Uh, for the most part, the clamping system that this table uses is extremely effective at getting rid of most small warps. Major warps is another story. I got the Orb record flattening device. And on the few records that this arm can't track, I put it in the orb, and a few hours later, it comes out flat, and it's not damaged any of my records. So I feel I've gotten uh, complete control over warped records and unwarped records on this turntable. You can adjust uh, azimuth by rotating this little knob right here, and that affects two cups and two points. The points are in the cups, and as you rotate that, it affects the azimuth. The um, SRA is set two ways. You can loosen a screw and do a gross adjustment by lifting up and dropping this shaft here. And then this rotates like a camera lens, and it's very easy to move the arm up in tiny increments or large increments. Everything about this arm has been designed both for consumer use and for someone like me who does a lot of changes of cartridges to make it easy and repeatable. And that's very important in my job, and this arm does all of that. So. The only other thing I can tell you about this turntable is the power supply. The power supply is a 24 volt Xenon rectifier based power supply. They spent a lot of time listening to various power supplies, a selenium rectifier, diodes, other kinds of solid state rectifiers, and tube based rectifiers. And they found the Xenon diode sounded best. And yes, can that affect the sound of a turntable? 
Yes, because I reviewed the Brinkman balance years ago and they provided both a solid state and a tube rectifier and you could easily hear the difference between the two. So every aspect of turntable and tone arm design has been taken into account in this turntable and uh, I'm very happy to say it's my reference and I love it. So this is the acoustic signature Montana Neo turntable that I reviewed uh, at least a year ago uh, for my previous endeavor. And the people that import this, Rutherford Audio, and the people at Acoustic Signature in Germany, outside of Stuttgart, were nice enough to let me hold on to this for a while because one of the frustrations of this job is when I had the Continuum Caliburn, and that was my reference turntable, it only took nine inch arms. You could put an 11 inch Kuzma 4 point on there because it has uh, an offset of the pivot point. But otherwise, no, I couldn't put a 12 inch arm on that turntable. And with the um, OMA over here, I can't put a 9 inch arm on it because this platter is an oversized platter, which I also like. So I had the Axiom, the Dieter Brinkmeyer's Axiom arm from Germany, which was a 9 inch arm, and I didn't have a turntable to put it on. So uh, Acoustic Signature was nice enough to let me hold on to this to do that review. And then, uh, as I was about to pack it up, the Kuzma Sapphire 9-inch showed up, and I had no place to put that. So uh, they let me hold on to it, and I put it on this turntable here, and they were nice enough to cut me an arm board for the Sapphire. What's really interesting about this table is that you can loosen a couple of bolts and move this section out and accommodate both 12 and 9-inch arms. And I wish all turntables had that, but they don't. So uh, that's the Yakuza Signature Montana Neo. It's a three motor design under this very heavy platter. And um, I normally don't like multiple motors. I figure I would rather have no motors on a turntable if possible, but of course you can't have no motors because it won't turn otherwise. And the closest to no motors that I've experienced is uh, the Grandioso over there, which there's no connection between the motor and the platter. But anyway, they've got three motors in here, and um, they made it work in a way that the speed accuracy was really good. It's very quiet, and uh, I've removed one one um, skeptical thing from my mind that I don't I don't like three motors. It works great in this turntable. And this is a really nice turntable. It's about forty thousand dollars without the arm, and of course I reviewed this with their arm, with the acoustic signature arm, but. Uh, that's in the box, so I could free it up for this. And one other thing, I'm keeping it a little bit longer, uh, and they're nice enough to let me do this, is I want to show you this arm here. This is the wand. This is also from New Zealand. This is a really interesting arm. I'm not going to take it out of this, this box. It's a carbon fiber pipe-based arm, unipivot arm. I got this in a number of years ago to review, and I was getting started on the review when the importer gave up the line. So I wasn't going to review a product that wasn't available in America, so uh, I gave it up. Then uh, a new importer came on board and gave the arm to my dear friend, the late Art Dudley, and he reviewed it in my previous endeavor. And so I held on to it because now I'm going to review it on the Tracking Angle um, website because it's a really interesting, unique design, and it's not very expensive, and it's very high performance, so watch out for the review of this wand arm. Let's talk about phono preamps. This is my reference, uh, one of my reference phono preamps. This is the CH Precision P1. Uh, you can use it by itself, or if you want to update, upgrade the sound, you can add the X1 power supply, which is about the same size as this. And I, once I heard that, I said, I, if I'm going to buy the P1, I have to have the X1. You can also do a four box version where each of these is one channel. So it's two, one for the left channel, one for the right channel, and then two X1s, one for the left channel, one for the right channel. I think that brings the total cost to $170,000 and it takes up a lot of shelf space. So I don't have the shelf space, plus I can't afford it. Uh, this is fine. This has three inputs, two are current-based uh, phono preamps, so it's really great with a low output moving coil cartridge that has a low internal impedance, and you don't have to worry about um, loading, because loading isn't part of that process, and it's extremely quiet, 
And uh, I love the sound of this thing, which is basically has almost no sound. It's a very, very fine, very quiet phono preamplifier. So there are three inputs, so I can switch between three different turntables at the same time, which is, makes it very, very useful for what I do. One input is a moving uh, magnet uh, input, moving magnet, moving coil, voltage amplification based uh, input. So the versatility of having both ways of amplifying a cartridge and having three inputs plus having extremely great sound uh, and adjustability, all computer controlled adjustability, makes this a really useful tool for a reviewer and a really fine product for a well healed audiophile. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of the Absolute Sound. We have a new product, it's on the Substack platform and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. So this is the uh, Dart Seal NHB18NS preamplifier, and the NHB stands for not heard before or never heard before. And one thing about this preamplifier is it's extremely quiet. It runs off of battery, it's battery powered. The original uh, NHB18NS had a battery system that was problematic and um, required the batteries to be changed every so often, which required taking it out of the rack and changing the batteries. This uh, new kind of battery, a new kind of charging system, is uh, seamless. You don't know it's a battery-powered device. It stays charged. It never runs out of gas. It runs for a long time. You have to be sitting here listening for 12 hours or 15 hours straight before it switches over to AC power. And um, that's not going to happen in my life. I don't know about your life. Uh, so it's got six inputs including a, a fully balanced input number six. Um, the previous version had a transformer coupled uh, balanced input, which is not nearly as good. So this is a big improvement over the original one. And the other funny thing is, you know, here I am a reviewer and the original did not have a way to see the, the DVs. So there was, and because this is a, a free spinning knob, which has a, it's a very sophisticated volume control, also very unique. It's not a ladder resistor type of device. It's an optical, uh, it's almost like equivalent to this turntable up here in the sense that there's no touching, there's no, there's no like resistors in, in the circuit. Somehow it, I'm not an expert on that subject. I'm not gonna go through it now, but that's how it works. So the original one I had didn't have a way to reference a, uh, a particular volume. You didn't know what you were at when you changed the input. So, you know, I, I went through a couple of tweeters <laughs> older speakers and and I said to myself what was I thinking buying this thing it's not it's fine for home use but for a reviewer it's not practical anyway this new one is solved every one of the issues with the original one it's super quiet it's also got a really good phono preamp built into it a moving coil phony phono preamp capable of 72 dBs of gain and loading and it's all toggle switchable on the back which for most people is not a problem for me it's somewhat of an issue because getting behind my rack is not easy, uh, but I still manage. I set, I set it for like 60 something dB gain and 100 uh, uh, ohm impedance uh, loading, and it, it's good for most uh, cartridges that I, that I use on here. But I've got external phono preamps too, one of which is not in the system, and that is um, the Ypsilon uh, VPS100 and transformers that are associated with that. That's out right now. There's not room in, on the uh, rack for everything. So that's the NHB. 18 NS and the uh, it also there's a there's a balance control uh, and there's other functionality that you can get to by pushing it on the um, on this knob right here but I'm not going to go through those it's a full function preamp and um, it's very quiet and uh, and I really really like it it'll be my last preamp I'm quite certain uh, it's got a mono switch and a remote where you can you can uh, do volume and you can adjust balance and mute and uh, you have to get up to change inputs and I really feel that in our in our business in our hobby more people in it really need to stand up more often be good for them all right uh, and let me, I'm gonna turn it off and show you the humorous aspect of the designer has a good sense of humor you turn it off and you can see 
it climaxes. So uh, fortunately, it's only in words. There's nothing you have to clean up. And then um, I'll turn it back on. And while it's getting itself warmed up, it's foreplay. So it's, it's cute, funny. So these are my loudspeakers. These are the Wilson Chronosonic XVXs. I reviewed them and I bought them. And I know what you're thinking. You're looking and you're saying, these speakers are pushed up against the wall. They're in the corners. This can't sound good. It sounds great. Believe me, I would not have bought these speakers had they not worked and sounded great in this room. I had the Alex's before this, the Wilson Alex's, much smaller speaker. They worked great. And then when they offered these for review, I said, I, I don't think these speakers are going to work in this room. And I sit nine, ten feet away, and they're, you see how tall they are. And uh, they said, look, we'll set them up. If they don't work, obviously, we don't want you to review them. We'll just take them back. Don't worry about it. I said, OK. So they set them up. And within a couple of weeks, I, a, couple, a couple of hours, I realized I, I had to end up finding a way to buy this. So I want to thank um, the estate of Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones and the lawyer who hired me to be the expert witness in that case because I made really good money on that. And that helped me buy these. And my turntable set up DVD that I made over 10 years ago, um, I thought I would sell a couple of thousand and make my money back because I put about 20 grand into that. I just got an order for 60 of them today while I was doing a, a previous take of this and had to be interfered with because I got the order of 60 more. So I've sold like almost 18,000 of those DVDs. You do the math. Even if you can't do the math, the number's really, really good. So, that, so I bought this. And I want to say to you, if you have money, I, I took it out of my retirement account, though, basically. If you, if you want something really badly enough and you're, and you're you know, getting on in years, um, just take the money out and enjoy yourself. Life's too short. You know, you look at what's happening out there. Jeff Beck, uh, Tom Verlaine, everybody's passing away. So um, just do what you want to do. I, I love these speakers. They work great in this room. And you'll notice behind the speakers, there's uh, some ASC tube traps. That helps. And um, I got those. Harry Pearson gave me those ASC tube traps in 1986 or 1987. And I've kept them ever since because they work great. And I've also got um, some RPG diffusers and obfusers in the room. And I've got uh, these. Um, apertures from, from um, um, still points that work really, really great. And the room's well treated. And the, the rec whole wall of records actually is, is a great way to deal with uh, decay. Room decay is really good, uh, better than tooth decay. And certain things in the room are not, look, it's not a perfect room, but it's a really good room. And it sounds great. I turn the lights out at night, put on a record. I could be in the Village Vanguard. I could be at the Concert Cavallo. I could be uh, at any great concert hall. and you don't hear the speakers at all. They disappear. And I know what you're saying. The people that hate this brand go, oh, I'm glad they disappear because they're the ugliest things I've ever seen. I mean, the comments under the review when it was published in my previous endeavor, it's just so, I don't understand what's wrong with people. But I like what they look like. I think they look really cool. If you put the grills on them, they look better. I don't need the grills. I like it the way they are. I love these speakers. This is my last loudspeaker, I'm quite convinced. Um, so these Dart Seal amplifiers are the NHB 468s. They're uh, powerful, but not the most powerful amps you can buy. They do about 800 watts uh, into two ohms. I believe that's the spec. And uh, they're easy enough to drive the Wilsons. Now, the Wilsons are efficient speakers. They're, they're approximately 90 dB efficient. But they do present a punishing load to, uh, to an amplifier. They're, they're down at one ohm uh, in many frequencies. And the average, while well, it's a four ohm speaker, essentially, it's, it does go to one ohm in certain places. Um, amplifier has no trouble with that. What's interesting about this amplifier is uh, it's got very few transistors in it. It's a very simple circuit. And the designer felt that the fewer transistors, the better. The fewer junctions that are in there, the better. And the entire power supply is on a spring suspended chassis. And when you get it delivered, it's locked in place. You take the, the locking uh, pins out, and then it, it can float. And you can, you can almost hear the difference of that easily. So that's all I'm going to say about this amplifier, other than it's got RCA single-ended inputs, it's got a balanced input, and it has the Zeal 50-ohm um, connector. So between the amp and the preamp, it's, it's the ideal way to connect the amp and the preamp together. And people who hear this amplifier, um, even the most devoted tube people come down here and they say, you know, if I ever get rid of my tubes, I would try to get that because it just doesn't have any solid state kind of residue. It's really smooth and open, but it's not soft sounding at all. It's, it's, it's the best amplifier I've heard here. So that's why I bought them and, and I love them.
So this is the Orb DF-011A disc flattener I talked about before, and I want to show you how it works. So it's a pretty heavy device, but you just leave it in one place, and you open it up. You take out this felt protector, and you take out a record, and you put it in. There's a spindle inside, so it goes right on the spindle, and you lower it down, turn it on, and it's a computer-controlled device. You can set it for 12-inch records or, or 10-inch records, and you can set it. To, there's all kinds of interesting settings on here, depending on what you're trying to do. You just push a button and wait till it beeps, and then it does it all automatically. It heats up the record very slowly and very precisely. It flattens it, and then it cools it down equally slowly and precisely. And when it's done, it beeps, and you know it's done. You take the record out, and it's flat. It's never ruined any of my records. And the way it works is it heats around the rim where the lip of the record is, and it heats uh, in the label area. So there's no heat applied to where the grooves are, so it's not going to damage your records. But it really flattens them well. And when it's done, you take it out. And this is a record that I flattened. I didn't even know I had. It's a Mark Levinson acoustical recording of a guy named Elliot Fisk, who was a uh, student of Segovia. And I didn't even know I had this record. I pulled it out. And I said, oh, this looks interesting. I'll play it. I went to play it, and it was all warped. I put it in the disc flattener. Now it's completely flat. So it's about $1,100 for one of these things. It's kind of expensive, but you know what? If you belong to an audiophile club, you can chip in together and let each member of the club have it for a couple of days or for a week and flatten their, their warped records, and uh, that's a great way to use it in a club. I'm sitting in my uh, Ecornus stressless chair, and believe me, there's a lot of stress when I sit in this chair. It's well-worn, believe me, after many years. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on these Sonic Presence microphones, and it basically turns the person who wears them into a binaural dummy head. I, I heard that. Don't say that. All right. Um, so it goes like this and like this, and I'm going to plug it into my phone which I have in my pocket, and there's a recording app. It records at 48K, 24-bit. It's pretty good. And uh, I'm going to play a song on my speakers and, uh, and let you hear what I hear. Now, obviously, it's not going to be as good as it is live, just like no recording that you own picked up by microphones sound as good as a live performance. You always know when you're in the presence of live music as opposed to reproduced music. But you'll get a good idea, because I've done this experiment and sent uh, files to people, you'll get a good idea of what uh, the system sounds like.
And now it's time for the obligatory show some records segment of our video. So uh, first here's the original pressing of the Beach Boys Pet Sounds, the original mono pressing. It's in mint condition. Uh, this is one of the worst album covers ever made as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it almost looks like it was, it was like a throwaway Pickwick Beach Boy record, but of course it's, it's one of the greatest records that Brian Wilson ever made. And it doesn't sound very good. Not very good sounding. If you want the best sounding version of this record, I would recommend to you So Tough by Carl and the Passions. This is a twofer uh, after uh, the Beach Boys signed with Reprise. And the twofer includes the mono version of Pet Sounds that Brian Wilson supervised as a reissue. And to me, this is the best one. There's one other version of this, and that is it was a separate record on Reprise and uh, not the best cover either, and not even the original cover, but this sounds just the timbral balance on this record and the whole thing is brilliantly done. And I believe it's an artisan a sound a mastering job. So I recommend that. So there's also the one that was done by DCC Compact Classics and that was very good also. I just, I just like the, the, the overall sound of this one better. And then uh, Acoustic Sounds Analog Productions did one recently and that one, they did not have the master tape. It's, disappeared somehow and they used the best available source and they did the best they could with it but it's not it's not great to me this this to me is the is the one to get so uh when i lived in los angeles uh i had a friend who was a doctor and his job for a while was to bring the drugs to brian wilson's house when brian was in his worst uh, state and um basically wearing diapers and, um, and my friend called me one day and he said hey Fremer you know who Brian Wilson is I, you know I said yeah he said well my job this this month is to bring the drugs to Brian Wilson's house you want to go it's a real shit show I said yeah okay so I went with him and we walked into this really beautiful house in the Santa Monica Hills and there's a high chair an adult size high chair there with cigarette burns all over the tray plastic tray and cigarette burns on the wooden floor below and there's a nice stereo there with with record collection and uh all of a sudden brian wilson comes walking in and he's he's wearing a diaper and and he says hey man i play some records for you but my my turntable's broken and i th first thought was what brian wilson turntable broken they've got plenty of money these people could afford to bring somebody in to fix this turntable so at least you can hear some music it was, it was so annoying i said this could be your lucky day this could be the day that i add some music to your left let me take a look so it was a dual turntable it was a 1009 or i don't remember what model it was but i knew new dual turntables really well and i took it out off the shelf and it was just jammed. So I unjammed it, I went into the kitchen, I got some Vaseline and, and freed up the cam, it's a plastic cam, got it to spin, and then I took the, the head shell off the arm and the cantilever was bent pretty much almost 90 degrees, but it was aluminum, so I got, I got a pair of tweezers and I straightened it out, I was able to straighten it out, put it back in, set the tracking for us, and I said, give me a record. So he took out a stack of records, no sleeves, no jackets, just the record. He says, what do you want? I got jazz, I got rock, I got classical. I said, you pick what you want. I don't remember what record he picked, but he picked a record. I put it on, put it on, and it worked. He just sat on the floor and just bawled like a baby because he finally had music. I don't know how long this system was out of commission, but that was... That's one of the things that, you know, one of the things that vinyl has provided me in my life, this great story, and uh, I'll never forget that story. And then years later, after DCC Compact Classics released their version, and I wrote the review of it in, in the Tracking Angle magazine that I published in the early 90s, one day the publicist called me and said, I have somebody here who wants to talk to you. And it was Brian, and Brian picked up the phone, and he said, and he just he remembered the whole story, he remembered all of it and it was just it was just so cool okay that's that story now if you want the best version of sticky fingers it's this one this is a german pressing this was an export only mastering done in america by doug Sachs at the mastering lab and it was only done for europe not for america and the way you would know it's the right one it's got a tiny tiny little tml stamped into one side t period m period l period but only on one side and this is the best sounding that i've ever heard so if you can find one of those i thought i found one in munich last year at, at the uh 
at the high end show. It was from Germany. I took it out of the jacket. It didn't have the TML, so I passed on it. It was only $80. I found one of these at Disc Union in Japan in mid condition. It was $250. I just I just didn't want to spend $250, so I did. This is one of my favorite records. It's uh, it's Sir John Allott of John Runborn. This is the original British transatlantic pressing with the purple and white label. This is an amazing recording. I think this was done at Sound Techniques, yeah, by John Wood, who did all of the uh, Nick Drake records and, and the Fairport Convention records. He was a great engineer. I think he's still alive. I tried to interview him once. I called him up. And he said, I'm not a very interesting person. You don't want to talk to me. I said, I do, I'm sure. If you let me interview you, I'm sure I could draw some great stuff out of you. But he, he, he didn't want to talk, so, so I didn't get that. This is the one to get. The um, American on Wyndham Hill is not very good, I don't think. I think it was done from a digital F1 uh, transfer. It's bright and hard. Some people like it. I don't. And then there's the American reprise where they added reverb to ruin it. I don't know why they did that, but they did. This is really, really great. Um, if you want the best version of Magical Mystery Tour, it's this German Hortzu version, which has side two in real stereo. The original American is electronically reprocessed for stereo because this didn't come out uh, as an album originally in the UK. It was a double uh, EP. And Capitol wanted a full album, so they took songs, Hello, Goodbye, Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, Baby, You're a Rich Man, and All You Need Is Love, things that really should have been on, some of which should have been on Sgt. Pepper, but they didn't, do, George Martin didn't do that. I think he later said he regretted not adding some of those tracks. So he sent over a mono tape because he didn't have time to mix it in stereo, and that's what came out in America, reprocessed for stereo. In Germany, a little bit later, they had this, and they did it in stereo, and it, it sounds phenomenal. They eventually did it in America later, uh, but the original's not that good. And this, this just happens to be a really good pressing. The stereo uh, tape of this that MoFi released, a cassette, is in real stereo, but not the record in the box set. Crazy stuff. So that's that. And I'm not really a, 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 an autograph fanatic, but I have some cool autographs anyway. So this is the original uh, uh, UK version of Kiko, which is, I think, one of their best records. And when I interviewed them in Philadelphia, uh, they signed this for me. It was really a fun night. We went out to record shopping. You walk into a record store with Los Lobos. Let me tell you, it's it's not bad. Good things can happen. And um, we went record shopping. We went uh, out for hoagies or whatever they call uh, Philadelphia cheese steaks, whatever they call them. That was that was a fun hang. Um, then I interviewed Keith Emerson, and um, he. He signed this for me, and I, I said to him, this is a, you know original British immediate pressing of this, and I said, so Keith, what kind of music do you listen to at home? And he said, I don't listen to music anymore at home. I, I, I watch the History Channel. <laughs> that was kind of, kind of disappointing, you know? And then uh, here's an original UK version of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young on Plum Label original that I uh, had Graham Nash signed for me one of the two times I interviewed him and then my final one is um, my original British pressing of Rubber Soul that George Martin signed for me and you know I try to tell my wife to I said let me show you some cool stuff in my collection that you know when I when I when I kick the bucket you want to know about these. You don't want to have, you know, like Chad Kasim come in and grab the whole thing at a dollar a record or whoever's going to get them. These you should pull out separately. And she says, I don't care. I'll, whatever. <laughs> Someone's going to get this. It's really cool. And then I have, um, this is the first British Queen album. And I cut the national radio spots for Elektra records on the first three or four Queen albums. And one day I was sitting in my apartment and the mail showed up and there was an, an airmail letter on that thin little, uh, like thin kind of blue paper that airmail um, letters used to come in. And there was this letter. And I open it and it's from the Hotel Bel Air in, in Hague, the Netherlands. And it's, it's like two pages written by Brian May in which uh, the, the publicist from Elektra had sent him a cassette of my commercials for Queen and some of my comedy things that I had done for the record store that I, that I did commercials for. And he said, uh, um, 
He said, anyway, what I, uh, what I want to say is thank you for the sheer heart attack uh, tape. You seem to be the only bloke who can really get these things together. In fact, we think your edits are more interesting than ours. <laughs> Just imagine yourself being a 20-something-year-old kid, and you've cut these commercials, and you get a letter from Brian May. It still is exciting to me to, to have gotten this. And then at the end, he, he signed, thanks again, Brian May, and he put in parenthesis, Queen, as if I wouldn't know who he was. So this is going to, this lives in this um, first Queen album, British Queen album jacket, and uh, some it'll get that one day. So there are only two other things I wanted to show you. So one is the Animal Olympics soundtrack. So Animal Olympics was an animated um, feature film that I co-wrote and did a lot of voices on with Gilda Radner, Billy Crystal, and Harry Shearer. In fact, I gave Harry Shearer his first animated film voiceover job, as far as I'm concerned, because I was responsible for hiring him. And um, this is the album that Graham Gouldman did from 10CC, and I also was responsible for him getting hired to do this. And Graham came to our studio in L.A. where we were doing, doing the animated feature. By the way, the animated feature film is now on um, Amazon Prime, so you can watch it. It's been on there since the Olympics last year, and I guess they keep it on there because it's, it's popular. I can tell you stories about Animal Olympics that are, but I won't right here. Um, but anyway, Graham came to the studio, and I sat down with him, and I also edited all the music for this movie, aside from co-writing it and doing voices. And I, I went through all the songs, all of the animated sequences, and explained to him what kind of music I think we, we should have, and uh, including instrumentation, and, and he did a fantastic job of writing and producing and performing all of these songs that were uh, done at, he did most of it at Strawberry Studios, which was 10CC Studio in Manchester, and some of it at A&M in Los Angeles. And I also supervised the mix of this, which was done in surround sound, even though this was actually done for two television shows in America on NBC, one for the Winter Olympics, one for the Summer Olympics. And then we put it together for a feature length, hour and a half feature film, and it played all over the world. And we debuted it at the Miami Film Festival in 19, I guess it was 1979, in surround sound. And it was on a four tracked mag striped uh, film. And the sound, I recorded all the sound effects in real stereo, Bloom line pair microphone. It sounded phenomenal. The music and the sound was great. And then somebody lost the master. We mixed it at Todd Ayo. We mixed it across the hall from where Steven Spielberg was mixing 1941. So we did this in a week. It, didn't, it wasn't that difficult to do. But the entire week we were doing it, across the hall, Spielberg was mixing one scene from 1941. It was the scene where John Belushi goes down in the airplane and crashes into the Santa Monica Pier. So it was like, ah, for an entire week. And we, we mixed this. And they lost the master. So the version that's on Amazon Prime and the only version that's available on uh, DVD and, and actually it came out on Betamax and VHS is a mono awful sound they pulled off of an optical track. And I figured that's the end of that. What a terrible, tragic story. But a couple of months ago, I got a, an email from somebody in the UK who said that they were 10cc fans and someone called them because when strawberry studios closed down they threw all these tapes in a dumpster this happens this happened a lot and it still happens it's crazy but but there was a dumpster and in the dumpster were all the masters for animal olympics and these guys went over there and took all of the masters and they sent me 96k24 files of not only the songs from animal olympics from, from, from the album but all the incidental music. And so it is possible now to restore this album, restore this movie to stereo with all the songs being in stereo instead of awful um, mono optical track. So uh, that's one of the projects I have in my mind to do as soon as I can and, and put that together. So I'm in contact with the people that own this movie now. That's the American one. This is the British one. And finally, here's the Tron reissue. So this is another movie that I supervised the sound on. And uh, I worked with Wendy Carlos. I was responsible for getting her hired to do this. 
and uh, it came out originally on uh, Columbia Records as 58 minutes on one record. It didn't sound very good, unfortunately. The movie sounded great, but this record didn't sound good. And I also, I wanted to hire the police to do the music on this because the movie, uh, you know, features Jeff Bridges as this edgy, rebellious uh, video game designer. And uh, he got fired from the company he worked for and he set up this arcade uh, thing in, in where kids would come play the arcade games. And so it was kind of an edgy thing. I wanted the police to do the songs. But Walter Yetnikoff from Columbia Records insisted that Journey do the songs because Journey was the hot band at that point in time. And I said, but I want the police. And Walter said, if you don't have Journey do the songs, we're not going to release the album. So we had to have Journey. And the last thing that the scenes needed, the last thing this movie needed was... Uh, ballads was, you know, big, glorious, grand ballads. It needed jumpy kind of stuff like the police did. So I had to go meet Journey. This is when they were as big as they ever got. I had to go sit down with the guys from Journey and explain that I didn't want them to do this, but I was forced into using them and I really wanted the police. I wanted jumpy kind of reggae-ish kind of music for this. And they came back and, you know, to their credit, First of all, they didn't beat the shit out of me, which they probably should have. They didn't. But to their credit, they came up with a song called Only Solution, where the drummer played like Stuart Copeland and Steve Perry sang like Sting. I mean, not, not imitations, but kind of sounded like... And the song is great for the movie, but it wasn't a hit for them. And uh, anyway, it's, it's in the movie. So this is the reissue that was done by um, DC, by uh, Audio Fidelity, which is used to be DCC Compact Classics, as Marshall Blonstein redid this. And we recorded the symphonic parts at the Royal Albert Hall with a 102-piece orchestra and using the organ. And uh, the, a remote BBC uh, truck came and did this. And then she mixed it back in her place and added all the synthesizer parts. And then there's a chor chorale in this that was recorded at Royce Hall in, in UCLA. And uh, all that was put together by her and it's it's fantastic it came out really really great and this is the version to have and it's out of print now well i hope you enjoyed that tour of my room and stories and everything else i had to say but it kind of sounds like an end you know it's, it's but this is not an end for me actually this is a beginning for me you know moving over to the absolute sound was a really great thing for me to go back to where I started writing about audio and and I'm happy to be back there now and they're really taking good care of me and uh, treating me well and starting the Tracking Angle website is an exciting thing. I've got 12 great writers with me now. We're going to have more and I'm really excited by that and I've got other things that I'm doing. I'm not retiring anytime soon. I'm working on a a record project right now that's so exciting to me and I can't talk about that right now but you'll know about it soon and uh, and that's it so I'm going nowhere I'm having the time of my life now and thanks for watching <laughs>